Okay, uh, we are continuing on uh, with gases. Uh, last time we talked about primarily uh, gas stoichiometry problems. Remember that gas stoichiometry problems are pretty much like normal stoichiometry problems, except that really at some point, uh, you're probably going to go into the ideal gas law. Now, you could either do it up front like we talked about, and that usually means uh, you would be doing it at like the second step there where you're trying to figure out the moles. So solving for moles from the ideal gas law instead of using grams to moles and molar mass. Also very commonly, and in a lot of cases, uh, we're interested, for example, how much volume of a gas we may produce. So it's very common in gas stoichiometry problems, as we saw, uh, to at the end of the problem, use the ideal gas law and solve for the volume. Uh, but you can use it in both places. Uh, for example, today, you will use it up front in the calculation for the gas lab today. Uh, you'll use it to figure out moles and then kind of work your way backwards to figure out grams of your mixture. So again, you can sort of use that uh, ideal gas law in both of those places. Uh, was there any questions on any of that stuff we talked about last time? <clears throat> we also um, talked about the idea that you do want to always make sure as well that uh, it's not just a stoichiometry problem, but it could be also a limiting reagent problem. So uh, that does pop up in any type of stoichiometry problem that you do. You always want to be aware of that. The next thing we're going to talk about is uh, partial pressures and Dalton's law of partial pressures. And it sounds really confusing, but it's really sort of a basic idea here. And one of the things that we can use to help us calculate something like the partial pressures of gases is uh, because they are oftentimes will come in a mixture of different gases, when we talk about sort of the ideal situation or an ideal gas, one of the main sort of components that makes something an ideal gas under normal conditions, again, is the idea that although you may have multiple gas molecules flying around in the same container, there's really kind of no interaction between the gas molecules, which means there's no attractive forces, there's no repulsion type forces between the different gas molecules. So that plays really well when we're doing partial pressure type situations, because although the gases may be in a mixture in a container with a bunch of different gases, uh, we could really almost assume like they're in there by themselves. And that allows the calculation to be really sort of straightforward and simple. And the idea here is pretty much that if we had a container that really only had one type of gas molecule, like gas molecule A flying around, the total pressure of that container would be all pretty much the pressure associated with gas A. Now, if we had another container where we had gas A flying around, gas B flying around, gas C flying around, uh, in this particular case, the total pressure would actually be a result of the pressure of gas A plus the pressure of gas B plus the pressure of gas C. And these are what are referred to as being partial pressures because each of them partially contribute to the overall pressure of that gas mixture. That's usually the atmospheric pressure, for example, in lab. That's like when you take the barometer reading there from the digital barometer there in the center of the lab room. Uh, that is your total pressure. So how do we go about sort of calculating uh, the pressures or the partial pressures of each gas in a mixture? Really, the main way or a lot of the ways that you do it is pretty much the ideal gas law, which is our PV equals NRT. The deal is we pretty much solve for pressure for each gas. Uh, so you would do separate calculations, for example, for our mixture there on the right, we would do this calculation for gas A, we would do this calculation for gas B, we would do the same calculation for gas C, and that would give us the partial pressures of each of these gases. Now, the nice thing about them all being in the same container is when we have to do that calculation, pretty much the volume for everybody is going to be the same because they're all flying around in the same container. And most likely that container is sitting in the same room, which means the temperature for everybody will be the same. And R is obviously a constant. That means when you're doing these sort of individual calculations to figure out the partial pressures of each of these gases, pretty much the only thing that's going to vary in the calculation is 
the moles. So you just got to figure out the moles of each of the gases and then individually plug them into the ideal gas law. A reminder as well, when we use the ideal gas law, right, things need to be in specific units. So once again, the pressure has to be in atmospheres when you use that. Volume has to be in liters. Temperature has to be in Kelvin. And obviously our gas constant is that 0 0.08206 number, uh, which has all those units, liters times atmospheres divided by Kelvin times mole. So as we can see here, again, we have this sort of mixture and because they're in the same container, we will have that same volume and temperature for each of them. And in that container on the right there, they are both contributing to the total pressure. And in an ideal situation, even though they're different gas molecules flying around, there's going to be sort of no interaction between them. And that's why we could do these calculations using the ideal gas law like they were just in the container by themselves, even though there's other gas molecules flying around. So as we saw there. Now, clearly, if you had multiple gases, you would just do multiple ones individually, add them all together, and then you will have your partial pressures and your total pressure in this case. So let's take a look at an example here. So uh, you have five grams of helium and five grams of neon in a 2.5 liter container. At 27 degrees Celsius, uh, what is the partial pressures of both gases and what is the total pressure? So we're looking for three answers here, partial pressures of each gas and the total pressure. Helium, I believe, is 4.003. Neon is 2018, I believe. All right, take a few minutes, get those through. Let's take a look. Uh, so once again, uh, in this case, we have a container uh, that's got helium flying around. It's got neon flying around. It has a volume of uh, 2.5 liters. Uh, we have a temperature that's 27 degrees Celsius, which since we're in a gas law situation, we know we do need to convert that to Kelvin. That will give us 300 Kelvin. Uh, we're looking for pressure. So you can kind of see the ideal gas law sort of coming about here. Um, so in this case though, we have the grams of helium. We also have the grams of neon given to us. Uh, we are looking for pressures of each of them. And we also need moles, obviously, to use our PV equals NRT. So we're going to calculate the moles so that we can actually solve for the pressure. Uh, using the molar mass here from the periodic table, we're going to put grams on the bottom so they cancel. 4.003 grams per mole of helium. We also use the molar mass there for our neon, which is 2018 grams per mole. So doing that for our helium will get us five divided by five divided by 4.003. Gonna be a 1.25. We'll do the same thing for neon, uh, divided by 2018. 0.248 looks like. Make sure on that so far. Now that we actually do have the moles, that's pretty much everything we need. We have our temperature, R we always have. We now have our moles and we have our volume. So again, we're just going to solve for pressure individually here for each gas. That means we do need to divide the volume to the other side. And that will get us that the pressure, for example, of helium would be NRT divided by V. Put in our numbers for helium, 1.25 moles, 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere Kelvin mole, which is the gas constant or R. Our temperature here is Kelvin 300 and our volume, which is in the correct units, which is liters. Liters will cancel. Moles will cancel, Kelvin will cancel, going to leave us atmospheres as a unit, which is good since we're looking for pressure. We're going to multiply across the top and then divide by the bottom. So 125 divided by 0 0.08206 times 300 divided by 2.5, going to get us a 12.3 atmospheres. And that number right there would represent the partial pressure of helium in this mixture. 
So this would be our partial pressure of helium. Any questions on that calculation there? <clears throat> now, because it's an ideal situation, we pretty much could just re-up the same calculation here for neon and it works exactly the same way, except that we do want to use the moles for neon. So putting in our values, temperature and volume going to be the same, really only the moles here are going to change. 0 0.08206. Same temperature of 300 divided by our same volume here. Once again, everything is going to cancel out except for atmospheres. And in this case, we will end up uh, with 2.44 atmospheres. And that would be considered the uh, partial pressure of neon in this mixture. Any questions on that calculation? To find the total pressure, I should do what with each of those numbers? I should just add them together, right? So to get the total pressure here, we're going to take the partial pressure of neon plus the partial pressure of helium, uh, which will give us 12.3 atmospheres plus 2.44 atmospheres. Going to give us 14.7 uh, atmospheres i believe when it's all said and done for our total pressure question on any of that calculation there so really just an ideal gas law done separately for each gas uh, in that particular mixture the major contributor here to the pressure in this mixture is which gas it is helium the reason is the major contributor is any ideas it is actually lighter. Yeah, it's only four grams versus 20. Because it's lighter, it will actually be flying around a lot faster. It'll have a much faster velocity, which means it'll actually do more collisions. And that's why it accounts for actually more pressure than we see for the heavier moving uh, neon, which is going to be moving slower because of the molar mass of it. Any questions on any part of that there? <clears throat> All right, so that is one type of partial pressure situation. Now, it is possible that maybe you're given some information about a partial pressure uh, situation or a mixture of gases, and maybe you're not given enough information to go into the ideal gas law. Uh, so maybe you're not given temperature, maybe you're not given volume, uh, but you are given enough information to get to the moles of all the gases that are present and one piece of pressure information. So maybe they tell you the total pressure. Uh, maybe they tell you a partial pressure of one of the gases that are present. So if you find yourself like, I don't have enough to go into the ideal gas law, but I have enough to get to moles. And they did give me like one piece of pressure information. You could actually use this calculation here to help you out, figure out the total pressure, the partial pressures. This is what abbreviated with an X and a mole fraction is basically the percentage without multiplying by a hundred. Uh, it's basically the moles of the gas you're interested in divided by the total moles and you don't times it by a hundred. So this, for example, is the gas we're interested in and moles. This is the total moles in the mixture. And if you do that, you can get the mole fraction for the gas you're looking for. And you can use the equation on the bottom, which is PI is equal to XI times PT. This is the partial pressure of a gas. This is the mole fraction of that gas. And this is the total pressure or the atmospheric pressure in that point. So this is a very useful sort of equation. Again, if you find yourself not really having enough information to go into that ideal gas law, but you got at least one pressure information or a way to figure it out, I suppose, and uh, the moles of everybody. So let's take a look at an example where we could use this equation. Uh, so let's take a look at this one here. In this case, we have a mixture of these three gases. We have methane, uh, we got ethane, 
And we got propane flying around in this sort of container. And we have the moles of each of these. So we have the moles of methane, uh, which would be 8.24 moles. Uh, we got the moles of our ethane, uh, which would be 0 0.421. And we have the moles there of our propane, uh, which is 0 0.116. So in this particular case, they did give us the total pressure. So we do have the total pressure given to us, which is, again, a very important piece of information to do this. But when we look at everything else, we have no temperatures, we have no volume information. So we can't really go into the ideal gas law, but we can use that formula that we just saw there. And if we want to get the partial pressure of propane, we could use that it is equal to the mole fraction of propane times the total pressure. So to get the mole fraction, we need the total number of moles. So we're just going to add them all together, and that's going to get us 8.24 8 plus 0 0.421 plus 0 0.116. Looks like 8.777 moles. So to find the mole fraction of the propane, which we're interested in, uh, we would take the moles of propane, which is 0 0.116. We would divide it by our total moles. Once again here, we're not going to multiply by 100. So that's going to give us basically a percentage, but not in a percentage form, the decimal form of it. So 0 0.0132. That basically means that in this mixture, there's like 1% propane flying around in that particular mixture. Now that we have that, sure, our partial pressure of propane can be found by taking 0 0.0132, times in it by the total pressure of 1.37, and that would equal, in this case, Looks like uh, 0 0.0181 atmospheres would be the partial pressure of propane in this case. We obviously could do the same thing for the other gases that are there. So if we were interested, to say, in methane, we could do the mole fraction of methane, which would be the moles of methane, which is 8.24, divided by the total moles of 877. Gives us a mole fraction for methane of 8.777. About 93% of it is methane. And if we want the partial pressure of methane in this case, we could take that 0.939 times it by our total pressure. And for methane here, we will see it is in this particular mixture making up about 1.29 atmospheres, almost all of the pressure there in this particular mixture. That is because a couple of things, right? There is like a ton more of methane flying around in that container, right? So it's going to cause more collisions. In addition, methane also happens to be the lightest of all those. So it's going to be flying around a lot faster than all the other ones as well. So it's going to cause more uh, pressure in that particular mixture. <clears throat> the smaller amount of propane, heavier as well, not gonna have as many collisions, only accounting for about 0 0.02 atmospheres of that 1.3 total pressure that we got going on. Question on this equation here. So once again, you would only really wanna use this in a situation where you don't have temperature, you don't have volume, you don't really have enough information to go into the ideal gas law but you have enough information to figure out the moles of the gases. And the other important component is you need some type of pressure information given to you, either total pressure or partial pressure. Otherwise, you really can't use this formula if you're not in that situation. Yeah, You should use the ideal gas law if you're not in that situation. Yeah. Other questions on that there? <clears throat> Got so these are two ways that you can get partial pressures and... Uh, two types of calculations that involve them. 
There's a third sort of partial pressure situation that develops, and it's what happened in the uh, lab last week. It is what's going to happen in the lab this week as well. And that is based on how we collect our gas and the situation that happens when we collect our gas. <clears throat> Everybody good? Yeah. So the next sort of situation that involves partial pressures is this one, which is pretty much the experiment you're going to do in about well, 50 minutes, 30 minutes, I suppose. Um, and in this case, we're going to take some potassium chlorate and you're going to heat it up, which means the potassium chlorate is going to go through a decomposition reaction and heat it. And it's going to break apart into potassium chloride and some oxygen gas is going to be generated. And since it's a chemistry class, probably should balance it like we're chemistry people here. On it. So as a result of this reaction here, you're going to have this set up uh, where you're going to put into your test tube. By the way, your really big test tube, not this big test tube, but the really big one by itself in your drawer is the one that you want to use. You're going to put your potassium chlorate in here. And in your case, you're actually going to have a mixture of potassium chlorate with something else. Um, so it's not pure potassium chlorate, so it's potassium chlorate. But the only thing in that mixture that will actually uh, is the potassium chlorate. So as you start to heat this gently without burning the clamp or anything like that, uh, you're going to produce your oxygen gas. It has nowhere to go, obviously, but through the tube into the water. And you will have a collection jar, which you already filled with or to the brim. And as the oxygen gas comes bubbling through here, the water will. And you do this or whenever you do an experiment where you collect the gas involving water displacement, the reaction itself will make the water kind of go into the gas phase, or at least some of it go into the gas phase. So what you end up getting in that empty space in your jar is not only just the oxygen gas that you're interested in, but you get also water vapor. And the water vapor in this case is pretty much just a byproduct of how you're actually collecting the gas that you're interested in. And we can find the pressure of this water vapor by looking it up in a table. But we're not really interested in it, so we do want to usually get rid of its contribution. So this creates a partial pressure situation where the total pressure of the barometer reading in this case would be the pressure of the gas you're interested in plus the vapor pressure of water, uh, which again is a value that you can find on a table. So in this we want to pressure just the oxygen gas by itself we would take the total pressure, which is our barometer reading. We would subtract it from the vapor pressure of water. And that will give us the pressure of just the oxygen by itself. The water here is sort of being corrected out in the calculation. And they'll sometimes refer to this as the pressure like of the dry gas, because you kind of subtract it off the water component in this case. So whenever you sort of collect a gas, uh, in this situation where water's involved, you usually have to do really this sort of uh, correction calculation to get rid of water's uh, contribution to the pressure so that when you're all said and done, you have really just the pressure of the gas you're interested in, uh, which in this experiment today that you're going to do is the oxygen gas. So if you remember, you had to go to the board there. There's a table up there that has the vapor pressure of water uh, in that situation. Here's a table from your book. Uh, where you can find those values. And it is based off of temperature. And in that case that we just saw there, we would take our barometer reading once again, minus the vapor pressure of water, which we would get obviously uh, from this table or a table like this. So let's take a look at a problem like this. Oxygen uh, gas that's saturated with water vapor at 30 degrees Celsius. The total pressure is 753 torr and the vapor pressure of water at uh, 30 degrees is 31.824 torr. That would come from the table. What is the partial pressure of the oxygen gas? This, uh, this is basically a situation we just saw on the previous page. In this case, we are 
collecting some oxygen gas here. And that's also how you know uh, it is this type of situation. Usually somewhere in the problem, they'll have a phrase like that, like, hey, it's saturated with water vapor, or you collected it over water. So they'll mention something about the gas being collected uh, with water. And that's how you know it really is the situation of the total pressure is equal to the pressure of the gas plus the pressure of the water vapor. So the pressure to water vapor, if it wasn't given to you, the table there and look it up. In this case, it was given to us. And also the total pressure there was also given to us. So all we ask to do here is 753 TOR is equal to the partial pressure of oxygen plus 31.824 TOR. We're basically just going to subtract that to the other side. And that will get us a pressure here of 753 minus 31 point 0.824. We'll call it 721 tor equals the partial pressure of oxygen. In this case, we are looking for the pressure in atmospheres. So that is where the 760 comes into play. So 721 tor converted to atmospheres divide by the 760. Tours cancel and that gets us 0 0.949 atmospheres. So both this and the 721 represents the actual pressure of oxygen gas, which you would be interested in this problem, uh, the dry oxygen gas in this case. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> question on partial pressure. So we saw three different sort of partial pressures. I'd say most commonly, if you're asked to calculate partial pressures, uh, probably going to be the ideal gas law situation. If it's something where it's like this, where it's experimental or the problem is sort of based on collecting an experiment, probably this situation. And probably for you guys, the third less situation would be the kind of the mole fraction situation, but uh, you know, may pop up. Any questions on any of those different types there? All right, let's finish up this chapter here. Uh, this is the kinetic molecular theory of gases, and you do need to know the different parts of it. And as we talked about, some of the parts of this is really what makes something an ideal gas. And Ideal gases is pretty much the only type of gases that we deal with in this class. We do assume that all gases behave ideally. Um, when you take 1A, you'll talk about real gases or non-ideal gases. And in those situations, you just take a couple of things into account. Uh, so let's talk about it here. Gases consist of tiny particles, atoms, and molecules. These are so small compared to the distances between them that the actual volume of the gas molecule itself is thought to be negligible. That one right there is pretty much uh, one of the th things that makes something an ideal gas law. We don't really worry about the actual volume of the gas molecules itself in relationship to the container they're flying around in. Uh, so that's why, again, in a lot of problems, what you'll see is they will mention about the actual container the gas is in rather than this is the volume of the gas molecules itself. The particles are in constant random motion, and those collisions and the number of collisions has a direct effect, obviously, on the pressure. Uh, the more collisions we have, the higher pressure, less collisions, lower pressure. Number four up here is really the second thing that makes something an ideal gas. And this is why we were just able to, in our calculations of partial pressures, pretty much to use the ideal gas law sort of separately for each gas, even though they're all flying around in the same container. And the idea of an ideal gas is that the particles are assumed not to have any attractive forces or repulsion type forces between the different gas molecules. So again, we could kind of assume in an ideal situation, which happens under normal pressures and temperatures that the gas molecules are kind of in there by themselves. In a real gas situation, uh, which is when you do actually have to take into effect these two situations, and that usually occurs at really high pressures 
and really uh, sort of low temperatures. And the reason it is is because at really high pressures, you probably have a very small volume. And because you have a very small volume, and even at low temperatures, those gas molecules are moving around really slow, and they're near each other for a very long period of time because they're squeezed together in a very, very small place. And under those conditions, you do have to take into account how they interact with one another. You also have to take into account the volume of the gas molecule itself because they're in a very small volume of the container. It is sort of relevant. So you could think of it as like in an ideal situation, if you took like a, a golf ball and put it in like a trash can, you know, it's going to take very small amount of the volume of the trash can. But if you took a basketball and put it in that trash can under a real gas situation, now the basketball's volume is kind of important versus the volume of the trash can itself. It's going to obviously take up almost as much room. So you have to take it into account. So in ideal situations, we don't have to worry about any of that. We could use the ideal gas law, which is actually a more universal sort of gas law for you know, all gases. The deal with the real gases is when you get to 1A, you'll see pretty much the ideal gas law, but it'll have a bunch of correction values to it, which will make it look super scary looking. And it is what is sometimes referred to as the van der Waals equation, uh, which takes into account uh, those interactions. Good news is you don't have to worry about that until you get to 1A. So we're all going to stay here with our ideal, but step two there and step number four is basically the two things make something sort of an ideal gas. The last one there is the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. The higher the temperature, faster the gas molecules should be moving. The lower the temperature, the lower the gas molecules should be moving and are slower they should be moving. So these are some of the relationships we talked about with our different gas laws. Uh, again, higher temperatures, we got faster moving uh, gas molecules, probably going to account for more pressure if the volume doesn't adjust. At lower temperatures, uh, we will have slower moving gas molecules, probably lower collisions as well. In a rigid container where the volume doesn't adjust those differences in the temperature we will see a direct relationship between as the temperature goes up, we will see more collisions and the pressure will go up. And as the temperature goes down, we will see less collisions and temperature will go down. And as we saw in Charles Law situation, which is the last one there, uh, a volume of a gas will increase as we raise the temperature at constant pressure. Once again, in a Charles Law situation, that is how it's able to maintain a constant pressure is as we increase the temperature, gas molecules fly around faster, the volume adjusts to give it more room to fly around, keeping the number of collisions relatively constant. Any questions on the relationships that we talked about here, the kinetic molecular theory of gases or gases in general? Yeah. All right, that wraps it up, I think, yeah, in this case.